Quindi vado da qualche parte, ma non la trovo. So, uh, I, th I hope the technical problems are solved, so perhaps you can confirm to me that the microphone is indeed working, because it goes, uh, it goes down during the lectures, so at some point it will disappear like it did yesterday. But anyway, uh, yesterday I, I was a little bit late, so it was stopped when I was uh, discussing the, some results which appeared in the paper of Gabriel and Panda di Panda. And I think the important thing is that I described to you what, how to obtain linear generators for the tautological This works in Chow and in cohomology. They are given by decorated starter classes. So the idea is that for every time we have a graph, we have a blue in map. which goes from some product of moduli spaces to MGN. So in each one of them, on which one of them we can pick some product of psi and kappa classes, and if you want also lambda classes. So one can take simply one if I want to take the, the fundamental class of something. And then one takes the image under the push forward of this. So they arise at the image of, let's say, tensor products of monomias, the kappa, lambda and side classes. Under the push mark. So it doesn't matter whether, in general, when we pass from the Chow groups to the cohomology, we lose a lot of information. But somehow, in this case, it does not matter. We can take the generators in both cases. We can take just the same. That's why the map, that's one of the reasons why the map uh, is well behaved. And then I wanted to uh, reassure, so this is the gluing map associated to the graph, gamma. And I don't think it's a I expect this has been known before, but anyway, it appears first uh, in explicit form in the same paper of Weber and Banda di Panda, which is devoted to the construction of non tautological classes. So, if you remember, we defined the tautological rings by saying, well, it has, they have to form a system of rings for all GNN that is closed and that pushed forward by the uh, standard forgetful and gluing maps, the ones associated to divisors. So, you may worry about what happens if you take the pullback instead. So we will get something that starts in the cohomology of M bar GN and takes an image which is, a, which is a tensor product of cohomology classes on each one of the factors. Well, actually, if we take the pullback, 
under the gluing map, and we start with the tautological class, then we get an image here which is a tensor product of tautological classes. So the system is automatically also closed under pullback. an arbitrary graph and take the associated gluing map, well, then it's, a, it, it's, then it's a tensor product with tautological classes on the factor. So, actually, the reason why Gaiba and Pandari Panda were interested in this property is that it's a way to uh, exclude, so to, to prove that there exist classes which are algebraic in the sense that they're an image of some, cycle, of some algebraic cycle, but which are non-tautological. If we take the tautological ring in cohomology for MG and bar, this is of course contained in the even degree cohomology of MG and bar. But in general, they are different. Well, why is this interesting? Well, the point is that if the genus is sufficiently small, one can actually prove that these two things are the same. So, so if the genus is different one, By definition, I, defi I defined it as a sub. Uh, so if you remember, I have two notations. This is the one in cohomology, this is the one in Chow. So if I define it directly as a sub algebra, the then. The one in Chow, do we know that it is injective or not? Uh, no, the one in Chow is even worse. And the reason is very easy. 
<laughs> to state because of the fact that in general, I mean, the modular spaces don't, don't have any, they are not uh, nice in the sense they are no longer rational at some point. So if you consider, uh, you can easily construct modular spaces of curves that contain uh, infinite dimensional Chow groups because uh, not all points are linearly equivalent, uh, no, sorry, not all points are algebraically equivalent and that kind of things. So one of the reasons one wants to restrict your tautological classes in cohomology is simply to be sure that one is working with something which is finite dimensional. So uh, in cohomology this is automatical, but in Chow it's not. No, I meant the, whether the tautological thing in the Chow yeah. does inject No, that's the other way around. I mean, we did. So let me just simply write this formula. What, uh, and then I will <laughs> make a summary of what I stated yesterday about this. What I wanted to say is, if the genus is 0 or 1, it is known what the cohomology of M bar Gn is. And in these cases, so... This is follows from work of Kiel in the 90s. This path had long been conjectured by Gessler. But the first proof to appear had been by, by Peterson. Let me see whether I have the year. Unfortunately, I can't quite find it, but roughly five years ago, I guess. So what I wanted to say is, well, if the genus is small, actually the two things are the same. If there are no marked points, you can go on a little bit and prove that every class is tautological, but already for genus two, uh, Graben and Panda Panda were able to construct counter examples. And now let me comment on what I wrote here, that the fact that it doesn't matter whether we work in cohomology or we work in Chow, but one can always construct generators for the, for the um, tautological ring, which have a nice description, which I explained here. And these generators are exactly corresponding to each other in the two situations. So a sort of, uh, well, I don't know whether it follows already by definition, but something which we, but, if we restrict the natural map so there is always a map from the Chow groups to cohomology. but of course so far it will just work with everything. So the Chow groups are generated by classes of subvarieties and so one would map this to the fundamental class. Of X. So of course inside here, we have the Chow groups of M, the tautological ring. And then if we can take the image here, one gets this. One could sort of prove it recursively using the definition, using the gluing maps. The fact that this map is subjective. one could prove it as some kind of corollary of the fact that we have generators that map uh, so that each generator here can be lifted here by taking a generator which is a, which is a, decorator, a, a decorated starter class. So the generators 
correspond to each other, of course. Expected there should be more relations here, so what one expects, eh? well, in general, one may well expect that there is a non-trivial kernel, but it's not known. In all known cases, they are the same. So, let me discuss these motivations I was saying for genus 0 and 1. Everything is known about this. And actually, it does not matter whether we work with a tautological ring or we work with the even cohomology, we have just the same situation. Actually, for m bar 0 n, all cohomology in, uh, all cohomologies in even degree. So this is easier to check. It's actually one gets the whole cohomology for m bar 1 n. There is cohomology in odd degree. So this is something which we can never get because the fundamental class is always in even degree. In general, in the image here, we will never get any class which is not algebraic. So which is not, we can't be lifted to a, an algebraic cycle on the variety. But even if we restrict to the good classes, there are counterexamples. So there are examples of classes which are, of cohomology classes, which are coming from the fundamental classes of some sub variety, but which are not tautological. And as I said, one of the ways to identify them is the following if we can find a class which, under the pullback, under some gluing map, is not given by a tensor product of fundamental classes, so if one find a component somehow which lies in the wrong space, then clearly uh, what we were working with is non-tautological. Again, for genus 2, at the beginning, everything seems to go nicely. So if n is smaller than 20, all, all even cohomology classes are actually tautological classes. But then from n equal 20, the things break. So they made some kind of ingenious construction in which we, they were looking at the locus of smooth curves in M220, which, are, which have a bioelliptic structure, so which have a double cover on the elliptic curve. Let me denote this cover structure by pi. Of course, pi should do something with the mark points. Uh, to, otherwise, we would not need to add them. And we simply require them to be marked pairwise, to have pairwise the same image in E. So if we have the point P1, then the other then P1 and P2 are mapped to the same point on E, and so on, until we take P19 and P20. So if we take P2K minus 1, then it has the same image as P2K. And we do this 10 times. There is a special locus of curves of genus 20 with mark points. This only makes sense as a definition of smooth curves. We don't care so much about what happens. So we will need to consider the generation as well. So we take the Zariski closure.
in M220 bar. So this is something we call dimension 11. But this class is not tautological. What was the issue with that? The issue is that if we take the intersection of Z with the locus of curves, which have two components of genus one, and then one needs to subdivide the mark points on the two sides, then if one takes the pull back under the associated gluing map, one gets, one gets a class such that one of the components is not coming from a tautological class. So let me write a little bit more about this. So this is the... Ah. So we need to, oh sorry, we take, need to take two components of genus one, and we subdivide so that we have 10 points on one side and the points on the other side. So this will correspond to a curve which has two components of genus one, and we can choose them for, the, for instance to be both to be both the same elliptic curve and then there will be some kind of trivial structure as a double cover simply by fixing you know, an isomorphism between E and E and matting them to the same point. So the idea is that we sort of glue the, glue the curve to itself at one point and then extend the, the identification to an isomorphism. And then one needs to fix uh, 10 points here pairwise and take the pre images according to the labeling we chose. So this lies, uh, this kind of curves belongs to the locus Z because this is some kind of the generation of this situation. This is, of course, something one needs to check explicitly. And if we consider the associated gluing map, then it goes from M1 with 11 mark points to M2, 20 bar, the images contained in Z. So if we consider the associated case, practically, if we take the intersection of Z with the image of this map, we will get this kind of curves. So the restriction of Z is actually the diagonal embedding. Point one once near this 11 point is that this is the first case in which m bar 1n has a cohomology class in odd degree. And somehow this fact forces 
that if one takes the pullback of the class of Z under this gluing map, one of the components is the tensor product of two copies of this. Uh, odd, uh, this is odd degree class. So this guy is actually a two-dimensional. And the geometry of the situation Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm expressing it not, uh, not very elegant, so uh, I, I guess that I should um, so um, if we take the pullback to Z, we'll morally this more or less the same thing as intersecting Z with the image, and I guess uh, that uh, This should be done in cohomology. So in this way, we are going to, to the locus of the intersection, which uh, is more or less the same as my m bar 111. And then this embeds diagonally into into this thing. But then here, we will find the class of odd degree, which we described here. And so this, uh, this, uh, so if you take two elliptic curves, so you are not I guess, uh, I need to make some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some checks about this because uh, yeah, every time, yeah, but if we have, a, I mean, we need to have exactly, for the general point, we need to have exactly one unique point and one unique point there. So we would need a degree one map from the one component to the other. So, yeah. And so for this reason, they have to be isomorphic, yeah, if I write it this way. Yeah, this, this will not work, yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the reason is exactly that, the, that uh, well, if one looks at the proof, the reason is that the existence of all the cohomology plays a role in all these constructions. Because, uh, as I said, one needs somehow to prove that the component by taking the pullback is not tautological. So, an easy way to to find a class which is coming from, the only way somehow to find a class which comes from something of smaller genus, which is non-tautological, is take an odd class. Because as I said, in genus zero and genus one, all even classes are going to be tautological. So the first counter example requires to work. So in genus zero, as I said, uh, all classes have in and degree, so there, there is nothing to do. We need some counter example which is coming exactly from genus one. But then you need, we need to have a class which is non tautological, so we need to have a class in odd, a in odd degree, so this is the first one we may use. Somehow, if we look at the geometry of diagonals, some components will have two lines inside here. So this is 
some kind of a trick, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, somehow there are more constructions associated, one could look to um, some kind of definitions of the tautological classes on uh, fiber products over the curve, and then once there one could study more naturally the properties of diagonals, but somehow in, uh, if one chooses the right geometry, then there is, uh, then there is the possibility uh, of uh, creating geometric counterexamples. And uh, if one works in cohomology using uh, the stratification with curves of, uh, uh, with, uh, with rational tails and of compact type, one can uh, sort of uh, control the situation more nicely and actually exclude the existence of any other non-tautological cohomology class in, uh, with for less than 20 points. So uh, by now, the knowledge of the geometry in genus 2 is sufficiently advanced that one can uh, explicitly rule them out. So we want to understand the structure of tautological rings. And to get a feeling for, for it, it looks like a good idea to start with the case, which is sufficiently easy. So let's review a little bit what is known, also what is the state of the art for the cohomology of MG without mark points and not compactified. So, which classes exist here? So, the, the boundary strata classes, they for sure don't exist, but we don't have any mark points, so the side classes are no longer there. So, a priori, for what we know, this is generated by the kappa and the lambda classes. So the question is, how dependent are they? Well, a priori, I mean, we have, uh, we have many of them, and then we can, of course, uh, yes. Yeah, well, this is just by, oh. so we can look, for instance, at the, at the description of the linear generators. So they have decorated strata classes, but here there are no, there is only just one strata with MG itself. So what we can do, what that theorem says by restriction to MG is we throw away everything which is not, uh, which is coming from monomials uh, of, uh, yes. So that is telling us, well, if we work with smooth curves, then we can only take monomials in the psi, kappa, and lambda classes, no math points, no psi classes. So, so far, so good. Then, the first one to study this space, also because he was the first one to give the general setup in which the theory of tautological classes work, was Manford in his um, 1983 paper. And his result is that we don't need the lambda classes at all. We don't need them, not even on the compactification. So if we take the lambda classes on M bar G, so, but when we study lambda classes, we don't need any mark points, because if you remember, they come from the Hodge bundle, which is not related to the, uh, to the geometry of the markings. Otherwise, I mean, we can always forget the markings and make computations uh, on M G bar. And they can be expressed as polynomials in the kappa classes 
and boundary strata classes. going to give you an overview of the steps in the proof. Uh, I mean, the, the paper of Manford is, of course, perfectly uh, readable, but uh, there are many technical steps which can be a little bit annoying. So the idea is that we can use Grossen de Riemann law. the universal curve of Mg, because that's where all classes we are considering originate from. So this would say that if we can take the child character of the push forward of the universal curve, uh, sorry, of the relative shift of the universal curve, then it's the same thing as taking the push forward Chen character of the same thing, but then we have to multiply with some kind of Todd class. But of course, we don't want to work on the universal curve. We want to work downstairs, so somehow this tells us if we push everything down, that is just equal that the chain character of the Hodge bundle, or I'm used to calling it E, but I think that I called it HG in the first lecture, is just one plus, and then one needs to think about this, about, about what happens here, but the thing is that one needs to take the formal exponential of the first chain class of the relative bundle multiplied by this third class. For the shift of relative differentials. The relative differential forms. And if one works with it a little bit, this means that the chain character of the Hodge bundle, yeah, I mean, the, the issue is with the rewriting this thing because one needs to express everything as a long sum, and then because of the fact that we have a Todd character here, and the Todd character is related to the, um, to the expression of the series of t divided by e to the power t minus 1, this is what the Todd character would do in the first chain class, we will get some Bernoulli numbers here. So we take the sum for all e, which is at least 1. And we will get as a coefficient a Bernoulli number divided by a factorial of 2i. And then we get a kappa class here. And then we get the correction term which is a party to the boundary. So the idea is that 
the lambda classes are the chain classes of the Hodge bundle. So on this side, we find all the information about lambda classes, just packaged in a different way. And then by looking at what this, at what uh, uh, this uh, uh, shift is on the on MGN bar, one can one can rewrite this side purely in terms of the kappa classes and something from the boundary which keeps track of the fact that we are gluing the curves together. So it's rather, so it gives some kind of correction term that depends on side classes when we identify two differences. When we identify two curves of a lower genus to create a, device, a boundary device. So we know that when we label the boundary devices, we have no marked points. We can always take something of genus H and something of genus G minus H. We should, we can stop at G minus, uh, at roughly at G half, but there's no harm in doing everything twice and then divided by two. And then for H equal to zero, we want to create the graph with a loop. So, they both give gluing maps. We know then by MH, they depend on the choice of H we did. And so uh, here we can take the push forward by MH. And then here we simply take the sum of all possible monomials of the appropriate degree 2i minus 2 of the psi classes on both sides. So what I was trying to say is that, uh, of course, there is some kind of correction term here supported on the boundary, but if one looks at the devices, one can say that this is sort of keep, uh, that it expresses the fact that we need to take uh, a side class on each one of the edges which are identified. And then going deeper, one can find this expression. So it may look puzzling without a proof, but anyway, it tells us a, a, a number of things, huh? but mainly it tells us, well, this means that we can express all lambda classes with these uh, strange coefficients, this is a multiplication, in terms of these, uh, of kappa classes, if we restrict to the interior, otherwise we get something which is quite controllable anyway. So it could be implemented. And moreover, if we look, at the right hand side, we find only, yeah, yes. Let me write what the definition is for the Bernoulli lambdas in this case. So the idea is that if one expands t divided by e to the power t minus one, and this is um, a function that is related to the way in which this Todd character is defined when working with line bundles, and then it's extended multiplicatively, uh, then the coefficients up to a factor which comes from the factorial of i are given by the Bernoulli numbers. So that's, uh, that's why we will always find something like this by working with this kind of character. And then let me tell you quickly an application of this formula. Well, everything we get here, you see the subscript, they are always, we are always taking something which is uh, of, uh, of odd degree on this side. So this means that uh, if we take an even degree part of the chain character, unless it's one, <laughs> unless it's in degree zero, we will get something which is trivial. So if we take the 
chain character of the Hodge bundle and we restrict to a dv v which is even is just zero in all non-trivial cases. So this is already giving us a bunch of relations between the lambda classes is sort of telling us we can eliminate, we don't need for our theory any of the even lambda classes. And then for the other ones, we can find an expression in terms of the other tautological classes using the other side. But then one can actually go further and exploit this expression a little bit further. It's actually easier, much, works much better, of course, if we just work on the interior and we forget about all the boundary strata contributions. And for instance, using this, Manford could prove that the tautological ring is generated by the classes kappa 1 up to kappa g minus 2. So one stops at g minus 2. with respect to the open part and we have no max points, this is generated by the first class. This is a, not as a vector space, of course, it's an algebra. hold? Well, first we can rewrite the expression we had before. So on the interior, the relations coming from Gottenich Riemann law can be rephrased in a more compact way in one. So if one wants to extract Relations, it's actually easier to write this as a formal series with some uh, dummy variable t, which is just keeping track of which lambda class we are working with. And this can be written as the exponential of the sum of the thing we had before. So with the Bernoulli numbers, Now the constants have changed a little bit because we have packaged information a little in a different way. Now there is the exponential which is taking care of i factorial, but we still get some coefficients. And this is the side telling us, well, We are starting with something which is supported only in a, an odd degree. And if you can check, I mean, this should, for instance, give that lambda 1 is equal to 1 over 12 kappa 1. To find this, you need to know that V2 is equal to 1 over 6. And then, from, for instance, from the vanishing of the second uh, of the degree part of the uh, degree two part of the chain character, one finds that lambda two has to be equal to one half lambda one square. And then going on for the other classes, one finds something which involves some Bernoulli number, and then the vanishing gives uh, additional relations. So the point is the lambda i's can be expressed in terms of the odd kappa i's.
And then what is the next step? The second step is to give some kind of uh, dimension uh, of bound on the rank. Because, at least on smooth curves, the relative dualizing shift is generated by global sections. And this implies if we take the pullback of the Hodge bundle to the universal curve, we get the subjective map of shift. The relative, the shift of relative differentials. So this is a subjective map. point is that we need some kind of geometric input, and this is the global generation of the relative dualizing shift. So if this is subjective, we can look at the kernel. And the kernel will be some locally free shift of rank, if you look at the difference, g minus 1. Yes, so on each curve. So somehow, yeah, one needs to. Yeah, not on the whole. And that's why we get the, the Hodge bundle here and not the and not a trivial band. Yeah. So, so the kernel is a locally free shift of rank g minus 1. So in particular, its chain classes will vanish in a degree which is higher. So formally, we need something there. Chain classes of the kernel, which at least in the Grothendieck group, we can, uh, is something which we view as the difference of the two shifts we are taking. But you can think of this some kind of notation for the kernel. Multiplicativity. One can equivalently look at the pullback of the sum of all lambda classes, which is what we call this side, and divide it by one plus psi one because. coming from the other side. And this has to vanish if j is larger than g minus 1. So if j is at least g. I hope we can see this, but the point is, well, if we have a, a bound on the dimension of something, then this gives us a bunch of vanishing. So once we have all this vanishing on the universal curve, we can push down the vanishing relations to find relations between lambda and kappa classes in every degree, which is at least g. And now what Manford did was to prove that these new relations are independent from the ones that express the lambda classes as polynomials in the old kappa classes, so they can be used. You sort of solve out, you 
you eliminate the lambdas from the expressions and you remain just with the first g minus 2 kappa classes. many of them because we can find it for every possible degree which is so we start as there is no uh, we, there is a lower bound but there is no upper bound point is uh, to prove that what Manford did was to establish there are sufficiently many relations that everything that starts with uh, uh, kappa g minus 1 need not be considered. is now uh, given elementa uh, uh, some more vanishing reasons and we can use them to eliminate the higher kappa classes. So this is a psi, uh, this is a construction which is particularly easy, but uh, the key point of this proof is something which we are, uh, uh, which people working on tautological things are still using, because they, they, one needs some kind of geometrical input, one uh, ideally one wants to find some kind of map between uh, vector bundles, locally free shifts over the modular space of first, and then there is some kind of geometrical information that gives bounds on the rank. And from this, one can produce some kind of, uh, one produce a, the vanishing of some classes on the universal curve or, or any other auxiliary space which is well behaved over mg and bar, and one push them down to produce even more relations. So this was sort of the baby case, and this had been used hundreds of times, and exactly as in the case of Manford, what is the proof? Well, part of the problem is to find a way to control the relation, to patch a kids gen together, to understand, because of course if one creates infinitely many relations, not all of them are going to be significant. So one needs to also to have some kind of a combinatorial skill to be able to select the minimal number of relations that can be used to reproduce all the other ones. because it can be anything, but it should map some flat way of energy. Which, let's speak loosely, we can construct
in some intrinsic way, vector bundles. So the idea is that in Manfold's proof, one is simply taking the universal curve and then as part of the definition of the universal curve, we have the we had omega, which was what we were using in the computations, but one can add even more structure. So, like, a, fix a, a divisor on each curve and take a space of uh, global sections that uh, vanish there from each curve and try to glue it together to a vector bundle, something like this, then one will have a larger, I mean, one, one can insert more data about the curve here to construct automatically some kind of vector bundle. And then one should use the geometry of the situation to find some form of vanishing, usually produced by the fact that there are some bounds on the rank. working on the auxiliary space, the one in which we have chosen more, more data. And then we take the push forward to MG and we find a huge number of relations. more relations with uh, some construction which is uh, um, related to the brill neutral theory of curves. So that will be the, will give the geometric input for the vanishing. And he was simply taking fiber products of the universal curve. So a curve with a, uh, well, with the device of a certain degree in which we are ordering the points which we consider. And that gave incredibly many relations. And then this kind of approach had been uh, um, generalized by Fanda de Pandel together with, um, with Marian and Oprah to the concept of stable quotients. In this way, one finds even more relations. And there is no reason actually to restrict to MG. One could also do it with the larger spaces. I'm stating it in this case because the situation is more controllable. And with this kind of approach, And taking as an auxiliary space the fiber product of the universal curve of an MG. So, and, uh, this kind of approach is actually due to fiber. Eleni Yonel was actually able to prove that. Uh, one does not actually need the first g minus two classes. One can stop at g divided by three. was able to construct many relations, but he was just using one, the, the geometry that was coming from the choice of one point. If you take up to D points and general geometric considerations, then what you find is, well, 
you actually need much less if you want a set of generators as an algebra. So. I'm writing it wrong, so I want, if I want to have Lionel's theorem, that's the one proved with algebraic geometric methods, then of course she's proving for Chow, because actually the result in cohomology is also true, but it has been proved by the in the same period, but with a actually more like topological methods by Morita. I think this appeared a little bit. Yeah, so. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean. Uh, Yes, I mean, it's not so, I, I don't think there is anything asymptotic about this theorem. I mean, the, the, first one, the first cases are only easier than the other ones. And anyway, there is no restriction, you, can always be, you could always be able to use less of them. But actually, I, I think this is the, the actually, and this is good because, I mean, this is, uh, this had, I mean, it had been proved in 2005, but this kind of uh, uh, property had been conjectured by Karel Faber already at the beginning of the 90s, like 1993, when he started to study the structure of tautological rings. So this uh, had been a uh, long expected case, but it took, uh, yeah, at least 10 years to produce uh, a proof of that. On the other hand, we are here we are close to the case in which we know independence. So this would not work if we are uh, working, we would not work directly if we are working with charlings, but if we are working with cohomology, we can avail ourselves of the results about the, stabi the stabilization of cohomology. The idea is that the cohomology of mg and that of m, let's say, g plus one of mg for any g which is larger than the original one taken is not independent. If one takes cohomology in a sufficiently small degree, it, one will get always the same thing. This is, called, uh, this is a phenomenon which is called uh, cohomological stability. So if one is working with a small degree, there is some information about the independence of kappa classes coming from the fact that if the degree is small, then it's the part of cohomology that has become independent of the genus. to summarize together the work of many people. So, <coughs> the fact that cohomology stabilizes due to hero in the 80s, then the bounds have been refined in many ways, in many times, first by Bolson, first at Ivanov, and now quite recently by Bolson. But then the characterization of stable cohomology has been known, has been open for a long time and known under the, number, the name of Manfort's conjecture, and it's now a theorem by Bartzen and Weiss. So here we have a long timeline that starts in 1985, perhaps, this may be 2012.
but the really difficult theorem is this one. And what they want to say, well, the point is, if we take cohomology in a degree which is sufficiently small with respect to the genus, then it becomes independent of genus. This is as a phenomenon <coughs> known under the name of higher stability. k plus 1. But this is good because approximately it's saying that k should be smaller than 2 than twice g divided by 3. So this is the degree of the last generator we have here. And in this range, cohomology is freely generated by the kappa classes. So this means that the that this first group of kappa classes we have here is going to be always independent. And this is what was known under the name of Manfred's conjecture and now Mass and Weiss theorem. And this, uh, I mean, uh, this is something, uh, I guess, uh, algebraic geometers, uh, so algebraic, we algebraic geometers are very happy about the fact that we know this. But at the same time, I guess that when the announcement was made, there was a lot of unhappiness because the proof of this theorem uses a stable homotopy theory and has nothing to do with the geometry of the modular space of curves. So it's a great result, but uh, the, nobody knows whether it would be possible in, any, in the future to give an algebraic geometry proof of it. It's certainly not started directly, by the way. It's proved now. So it's a good news, but I want one feels a little bit, uh, yeah, yeah indebted to the colleagues. On the other hand, this is, uh, this is clearly something that requires uh, uh, some kind of topological input, because how is the, the stability map, so the map inducing the isomorphism, how is that defined? As I said, if an algebraic, geom algebraic geometer, you don't want to study Riemann surfaces with boundary because there is no way to express the boundary in an algebraic geometric way. But, well, this is just our situation. Not everybody, if you are a topologist, you may love surfaces with boundary and there are some advantages to them because if we take something of genus G with a boundary. So this is, will be an element of something that stays in the modular space of genus G, Riemann surfaces with a parameterized boundary. Then you can construct a map that associates to it something of genus G plus one. Again, with a boundary, simply by attaching a Riemann surface of genus one with two parameterized boundaries. So one fixes this guy and one can attach it by, make it, by increasing the genus of the Riemann surface in a controllable way. So okay, it's very clear that this map exists and that it's uh, well defined, but of course, it only makes sense if one considers an, uh, an auxiliary map in which one is filling uh, the gap by attaching to it some kind of cover. And the same map allows us to compactify 
the other side. So there is no direct way from, to go from here to there. But if one can prove that the maps going down are isomorphisms in the certain range, the horizontal map are isomorphisms in the certain range, one gets the mapping homology, which gives instability. And then one can try to be clever and to find some kind of meaning of this also from an algebra geometric point of view, but the fact remains that you can't map mg to mg plus 1 in a natural way. So the question is, well, using this kind of, so using stability, we know that now the result one has for the generators is sort of optimal. But of course, there is no guarantee about uh, how to find uh, all possible relations between the polynomials in the given kappa classes. So what is the evidence up to now about that? Well, first, of course, we don't expect a cohomology, sorry, a tautological groups to, to be non-trivial in arbitrary high degree because there are, of course, dimensional constraints on that. But when do they exactly become trivial? Well, this is a problem that has been studied by Loyacha, and he would conclude that anyway, well, I guess I can state it in Chow because it implies the other one. If the degree is at least g minus 1, then cohomology vanishes. And then, well, this is something that Loyicha found by giving a very um, precise geometric description of generators. So he was not working directly with the kappa classes, but working with classes uh, of multiple covers of P1 uh, such that the mark points uh, are lying over zero and infinity in the ramification locus. So the question is, what happens for G minus 2, well, what Loyacha said, this is generated by the class of the hyperelliptic locus. At the time, it was not even known that it was uh, non-trivial. So it was either uh, one-dimensional or trivial itself. But then Faber was able to prove that there is a class in degree G minus 1, 2, which is non-trivial. One can take, for instance, the kappa class. And so this is a generator. So this means that the uh, topological rings start in genus in degree zero, where they are one-dimensional, and they end in degree g minus two, when they are one-dimensional again. But actually, there is more evidence of a symmetry between uh, low degree and degree close to g minus two. And even the shape of the known relations between the kappa classes was actually particularly nice, and this is part of the conjectural description for the, uh, for the tautological ring of Mg that Faber gave it the, during the 90s. So first there are explicit formulas expressing, uh, to express the intersection numbers of the kappa classes. So to express all monomials of degree g minus 2 in the kappa classes as multiples of k g minus 2.
this was known by the name of the intersection number conjecture. This has been proved, but this was really tough. Indeed, the first proof consisted in uh, saying that this expression could be interpreted, so would follow from a special case of the Virasoro conjecture. This is something that uh, Gessler and Pandari Pandari did, of course, the Virasoro conjecture was not known in that case, but then one can, uh, now is known, right? it was just known later uh, by work of, um, of given time. And then after that, more geometric proofs arose. So there are by now many different approaches to prove that the intersection numbers between the couple classes are what one expects. Once one has a nice formula for the intersection of any two kappa classes, now the next question is, is it enough to know the intersection numbers between kappa classes to find all relations between kappa classes? So the idea is that we have a pairing between tautological classes in degree G. It one can be stated in an I for, in, in, a, in cohomology if one prefers. The, the, the conjecture exists for both spaces. And then one takes something of co-dimension I, but because of the fact that we want to end up in degree G minus 2, this is the top degree we take. So the intersection will give something in degree G minus 2, but that isomorphic to Q. And this gives a perfect pairing. information to determine the ring structure of the tautological ring because we have all generators and we can calculate all the relations from the intersection numbers. Before conjecture is something like this. Uh, Faber checked uh, his, uh, uh, that this property held uh, in all possible cases he could control. So when he stated the conjecture the first time, I think it was known up to genus 15. By now, we know that the property holds up to genus 23. So anyway, If you remember the bilational geometry, we are now out of the range in which mg is not of general type, or at least uh, in which mg is rational. 
Because it is this. So. But then, what happens in genus 24? So, well, if one takes the same construction using auxiliary bundles um, of uh, fiber products of the universal curve or the spaces of the uh, uh, modular spaces of stable quotients as Panda de Panda does, well, how, what does one get exactly in this case? How far can one get? some kind of inf unfinished work here. Because if we take the cohomology of M24 in degree 10, it's known the dimension is 36. And I think it's even known that the 36 generators are, that are left out are actually independent. But if we take all known relations, what is known is the cohomology of R12, which should pair with R10, is at most 37. So somehow one would need just one additional relation to prove that the property holds also in this case. But, I mean, by now, incredibly many um, such relations have been in existence, but not a single one had cut something new here. And the expectation is indeed that this is going to lead to the first counter example. So that one should need to prove the intersection numbers of these uh, 37 things are different from something of complementary dimension, which is not tautological. So, uh, thank you for your attention.